four meet the family scaling the property ladder. This week's would-be property developers have bought their home for 159,000. They'll spend 20 grand doing it up over the next six months to make a profit of 121,000 pounds. This is the series that shows you how to make money from your property. And this week, it's serious cash. Most people would see a bungalow and they'd think, lick of paint, tidy the garden, lay some decking. But Terry sees a bungalow as a money-making opportunity. Extend upwards, extend outwards, and make a profit of six figures plus. In 1986, Terry bought his first home. After some minor renovations over a couple of years, he sold it and made a 26,000 profit. In his next home, he converted the loft and built a garage. He sold it a few years later and again made 26,000 profit. In his last place, he extended the back, put a couple of bedrooms in the loft and sold it last year for a profit of £114,000. Terry and his wife Sarah originally bought this bungalow for £159,000 and they're planning to do it up over the next six months. How much do you hope to sell it for? What do we hope to sell this house for? Around about, I would say around about 300,000. And, and how much are you hoping to spend on it? About 20,000. 100,000 pounds profit. 10 of those and you'll be a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> Terry paid the 159,000 pounds for this bungalow in cash, with the capital he's made from his previous properties. He's spending 20,000 on extending upwards and outwards, and he aims to sell for 300,000. That'll make him £121,000 profit. But he hasn't split up his budget, which is very, very dangerous, and it means it could run away with him. This is what he should be doing, a plan I advise you to follow. Add up the work you need in the following areas. Electrics, plumbing, joinery, plastering, flooring and decoration, and external works. Now, add up that lot and put on 10% for contingencies, in my experience, you'll need it. If you don't have that kind of cash available, then juggle the figures from one area to the next and decide what you can afford. Terry's new bungalows in Kent because that's where he paints houses for a living. Our man preys on bungalows for two reasons. One, they usually have enormous back gardens. This is a prime attraction to families wanting to move out of London to the home counties. Secondly, bungalows have a huge amount of wasted space in their lofts. Fantastic for converting into extra bedrooms. And they add a great deal of value to the property. There is so much space up here. I mean, this is waste. This is really waste. There's too much money to be made out of bungalows. I think bungalows are gold mines. You get the right one, you find the right one. It's clever of Terry to spot the big money-making potential in developing bungalows, but it has its costs. Unlike the professionals, his family have to live in the bungalow he's doing up. It's the price you pay for being an amateur property developer. But all this could end if they get this new place done up in six months and make 121,000 profit. Then they'll have an escape route. We might buy two properties next time. Yeah. Could buy two properties and do it up. Two smaller properties. That, that is the solution. Live in one and then do up the other one. And yeah, not have to live in, in live chaos. Live in a pit. <laughs> live, live in a pit. <laughs> so the challenge is on to make 120,000 in six months so they can buy two places next time. And here's the plan. Terry's bungalow nestles in the corner of some amazing countryside, so to capitalise on these views, he's going to extend the back of the bungalow by building a huge garden room. He's also going to convert the loft and create two extra bedrooms, a toilet and a shower room. Day one in January. The grounds rock hard and they're clearing the garden for the foundations of the new extension. Time to pay a visit. I'm not convinced by this. I've always thought that names on houses and towns is a bit naff. Best left to cottages in the country.
Hello. So this is the bungalow? That's yes. Right. And yes. where's work starting? I'm going to put a window there, brick up about two foot there and put this stained glass window in here. Do away with this door because this is going to be the hallway. So this is one of the main parts. And you okay. don't want a front door then into the hallway? No, 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 no not no, here. No. What? Because the bedroom there is, we've got three bedrooms there. So we don't want people coming round and, and waking up the kids. So no, we're moving the front door down building. Right, and the stained glass window? You're yes. Do you think that might be a bit personal? No. It sounds no. expensive, a stained glass window. <laughs> yes, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> You've got what? no idea what it cost you either. <laughs> So let's go in and see the rest of the house. Okay. As a developer myself, I think the decorative windows are a complete waste of time and money. It's unnecessary and it blocks the front door, meaning the only way in and out of the house will be through the kitchen. At the front of the bungalow there are two bedrooms. They'll just need to be decorated and tarted up. Between the front bedrooms and the sitting room is a small box room, which may become a study. But it's the back of the bungalow where all the real action will take place. So this is the sitting room. Yep. What are you planning on doing in here? We're going to have a big fireplace, because it's obviously lacking one at the moment. So we've got to open that up, widen the, the, the chimney breast, because it's not wide enough. And what are you planning on doing to the doors and the door handles? Changing them round first. <laughs> <laughs> they all it's open the wrong way. You come in and you walk into the wall. Doors were always hung that way round. The Victorians started it because they thought that as you come into the room, you didn't want to see the room no. without going yeah. into... Yeah, they all, all are hung. Yeah. If you go into any old house, they're all hung this way round. I spent half my life changing yeah. the other, hanging the door, which I agree with you, it's absolutely ridiculous because yeah. you want to see the room as you open the door. From the sitting room, we go through the hallway to the kitchen, and this is where the most ambitious part of Terry's design starts to take shape. Right, this is the kitchen. OK, and your plans in here? Knock that wall down and put new units in. Everything's just going to be gutted. We were hoping to have an island, weren't we? We were going to have an island. The disadvantage with an island is the extra units uh, that you've got to spend the money yeah. on. And again, it's a bit inflexible for the new people. You can't eat in, around an island. No. Someone could have this as a kitchen breakfast room. Beyond the kitchen is the 130-foot garden. Terry wants this landscaped and hopes it'll be a huge selling factor. The views from his planned garden room should be stunning. This room has a daring design for the ceiling. It's called a skiling, an open roof so the sun shines through the flat windows. It's a simple design and quick to build, which is just as well because time is money. It's a south-facing back garden. This is why we couldn't have a conservatory because it'd be too hot. If we can keep our eye on what the children are doing. Yes, yeah. I have to say, this is really going to be an amazing room. Terry's maximising profit by adding more rooms. Apart from extending out the back, he's also going up into the loft, packing it with two new bedrooms, a shower room and a toilet. OK, I have three worries. One, he's not going to do all that work for £20,000. Two, he's not broken down his budget into sections, meaning it could easily run away with him. And three, is £300,000 a realistic asking price? He's right about one thing, though, and that's marketing to families. But let's double-check by looking around the area. <laughs> Terry Street's nice, if a little run down, and it looks a bit like a retirement estate. It's a very good idea when you buy a property to, to develop to have a bit of a drive around the area and see A, what there is to offer, and B, just to get a feel of other properties around. If you're thinking of buying a property to develop for the family market, make sure the area has these features. Good transport links for any commuting parents. Terry's chosen well. Hildenborough's only 30 minutes from London. And it's within easy reach of the M25 and the major airports. Some of the top schools in the area. It's very important you check what catchment area you're buying into. Look up the school league tables if needed. Summerfield, that's good. Make sure your target area has a range of supermarkets to suit all pockets. It's essential for the weekly family shop. It's good to see some banks around. And look out for quality restaurants for your target family's night out. It's also a good idea to see what all the parked cars down the street look like. 
Look for car dealerships. If you've got a car dealership of an expensive make of car, it's obviously quite a wealthy area. You just have to market your property to the right people in the right way at the right price level. So he's bang on with the right area for families, although the retirement aspect of his street worries me. But who knows, it could be a clever move on Terry's part, a calculated risk. After all, the street will be quiet and safe for children. But what about the 300,000 price tag Terry's after? Is it realistic? One way to tell if you have the right selling price is to check out other properties close by with local agents who know this area. This bungalow is four doors down from Terry's and is up for 225,000. It has three bedrooms, this is two less than Terry will have. There's also a reasonably sized bathroom, a spacious kitchen and a 140 foot garden that's bigger than Terry's. A oh, great view. So this house is on the market for £225,000, yes. and it's three bedrooms. That's right, yeah. Terry's house is going to have five bedrooms and two bathrooms and a kitchen extension. Do you think he'll get £300,000? From experience, it'll be difficult. It'll set a precedent for the area. Um, what you've got locally is a retired area. You're building a family property which won't fit in with the surroundings in terms of attracting people with families to, to the area. The ceiling price is around 250 for the road. Whether you achieve up to 300, right. I'd say, yeah. is debatable. So our estate agent reckons 300,000 is 50 grand too much for this area. But I think Terry may be shrewder than he looks. It's time for me to interrogate him. I need to know how he's going to shatter the ceiling price in this part of the town. Believe it or not, there's going to be 14 rooms, including the hallways. 14 rooms. There's only six houses. I think six, seven houses in this road. I've got this size back garden. Self-facing, you know, the garden's going to be landscaped. When people move in here, they haven't got to do anything. But at the end of the day, it's no. location. You can't move the house. It's still in the same location. Yeah, but there's nothing wrong with the location. The road is in need of resurfacing. It has signs of being in poor repair, the street. However big the garden is, it's still going to be on an estate and not in a more popular area. You're half going to upset a few more neighbours, you know that. <laughs> well, I'm very confident of getting this figure. No problem. In I fact, I will get more than that. I love prov proving people wrong. Hey, here we go. Terry Rich is adding a new garden room extension and loft conversion to his bungalow. It's late January and he hopes these alterations will make him over £120,000 in profit when he sells the place in six months' time. He's the bungalow conversion king. An extension is one of the most effective ways to add value to your property and these single floor dwellings have a roof just waiting to be changed into bedrooms. Papa. One of the few things that might dent Terry's supreme confidence is the neighbours. They've already put the boot in by objecting to his planning application. It's important to remember that your neighbours may have a say in the planning process. You don't always need planning permission to make changes to your property. For example, it's not required if your extension is less than 50 cubic metres or 10% of your existing building. However, check with your local council whether you need permission before you start your building work. To get planning permission, you need a scale drawing of your property and also plans of how it will look after the renovation. Architects charge around £55 an hour for this service and you can find one through the Royal Institute of British Architects. The application and plans are then registered with the council for £95. The neighbours then have 21 days to object to the application and if there are more than two objections, the decision goes to a committee. Neil Hewitt's the principal planning officer looking after Terry's project. How much power do the neighbours have? If they really don't want it, can they stop a, an application going through? No, not, not really. The, there is a right, obviously, for the neighbours to make their views known to the council when the planning application comes in. And at the end of the day, the council has to make a decision um, based on both views, both parties' views. 
So would you have any advice to give to first-time property developers when they put a planning application in to make your life and their life easier and to make the application smooth sailing? Talk to your neighbours before you put the application in because quite often what we find is the neighbours, when they get the, the notification letter from the council, they are concerned that it's the first they've heard about it and sometimes actually smoothing the way by talking to your neighbours in the first instance can, can solve a lot of problems later on. Terry had to agree to reduce the size of these dormer windows to please the neighbours. He also has to use frosted glass in this one, so he can't spy on them in their garden and invade their privacy. If you want to change your plans during the work, you must submit the minor amendment to the council and an officer will decide if it's OK. It's February, and up go the walls to the new garden room. Terry's project managing tradesmen he's used in his previous houses, people he knows and trusts. Finding good tradesmen is one of the most important parts of your developing process. Here's five points I stick to when putting together my team. One, by far the best way to get hold of reliable people is word of mouth referral. Two, always get three quotes and interview your tradesmen. Three, ask them for references from previous projects. Four, make sure they sign a written contract up front. And finally, five, confirm your method of payment and check they have insurance. You've got to get a good carpenter. I mean, I've had Martin do the last couple. It's nice to come home to see Martin sorted it. <laughs> I do, I'll come home, Martin's gone. I'll get up on the scaffolding and see he's done the job. Yes, yeah, that's, that's good. Martin's going to be constructing the new roof of the extension, the most ambitious part of the whole project. All these tiles have got to come off because the timbers have got to be cut into, into the old roof. I mean, that is the most awkward thing with this, is the, is the roof. A lot of people have flat roofs because they can't be bothered. A hole has to be made in the existing roof to get the beams up into the loft that will connect the new garden room to the old bungalow. When the roof is open, Terry and Sarah are at the mercy of the weather, something a developer always keeps an eye on. I upset the kids this morning because they was watching something on TV and it's straight onto the weather forecast. I bought a couple more tarpaulins just in case we need them. I don't want it to rain, especially since the tiles are coming off over our bedroom at the moment. So uh, it's not going to rain. Oh dear, yet another rule of property developing. Expect the unexpected. The rain won't stop the project, but it will slow it down, making the wood harder to saw and the carpenters grouchy. It would be nice if it was sunny, but um... No, we work in the rain quite a lot. Can't not work in the rain, especially this year, as it hasn't really stopped raining since uh, October. Until that roof goes on, we are at the mercy of uh, the wind and rain, unfortunately. Do you know, I've been sure there's been somebody up in the loft. But it's obviously just all the things creaking about. I can't see past this bit at the moment. I can't see it ever looking nice again. I'm sure it will, but I can't see it at the moment. It's just, it's just a mess. Your only defence against the unexpected is meticulous planning, which is why I'm glad they're starting the garden early. All too often, people forget about the garden. Incredible, as statistics show a good one can add 10% to the value of your property. And when you come to sell, a well-tended garden often ranks higher than central heating or the size of the rooms. So Terry's called in a professional garden designer. She's charging £500 for a full set of drawings and planting lists, which is about average for a garden of this size. A few tips for you. Steer clear of themed gardens, unless you're aiming for a niche market. They won't add value, and you want to stay as neutral as possible for viewings. To save money, try designing your own garden. Short courses are available at most colleges to help you learn the basics. If your budget is tiny, try these for a quick fix. Cover old turf with new, hide old concrete with cheap shingle. Use potted plants to liven up the place. Once you've sold the house, you can take them with you. And don't forget foliage. It's just as attractive as flowers. So they're being sensible about the garden, but they're not being sensible about the decorative window. It's such a waste of cash. Shows no unifying style and it'll block up the front door, so you'll have to enter the house through the kitchen. Not a good idea when you invite your boss back for a meeting and the kids are eating dinner. Yeah, 
I like it. I think it. it's lovely. Goes with the rest of them. It does. I like the colour. That works nice. Excellent. Do you not think that maybe this is getting very personal to the house? Making such a statement possibly could be a problem when you come to sell it. Somebody is going to definitely have an opinion on this. They're going to have a very strong opinion one way or the other, which is always a very risky thing to do when you're doing a house to sell. No. So yeah. It's going to be too big to have just totally clear. It's got to have a yeah, design. A How much is this, does this cost? Is this expensive? Tops 500. It is quite a lot of money to spend, though, You don't isn't like it? it, do you? <laughs> well, <laughs> if I was honest... <laughs> So you're sure you're not going to have any problems with planning permission or the neighbours with this? Probably. Because <laughs> they're such prats. <laughs> with the garden and window ordered, Terry is now trying to finish the roof of the new garden room. Terry is three weeks into the project and he is already facing some problems. This is very common with property developing, but the real skill is working out how to overcome them. I think Terry is having problems because he's rushing. He seems that kind of person and I bet it'll cost him. A great progress. Walls are up. Roof structure's going on. Hi. Hi. I hear you've got problems with the roof. Yeah. So the roof's going up and the profits are coming down. It's definitely coming down. <laughs> you want to come up and have a look? OK, I'll just go get changed. Okay. Loft conversions and extensions add value to your property, but you have to plan carefully. It should be so simple. But Terry came home yesterday to find the garden room walls higher than those of the house because he hadn't read the plans properly. So you were a bit surprised when the, the planning... Surprised? I was shocked. <laughs> so you didn't read your plans properly, did you? But no, I'll definitely read the plans next time. You've always got to ask. If you don't oh, understand, yeah. don't yeah. feel worried about sounding stupid, just ask. Yeah. So how much extra does it cost you to build the extra it's couple of feet on top? probably cost me an extra day with the bricklayers. Um, couple of feet more maybe with a timber but otherwise you know I would say probably about another 500 pound it's cost me. So you're 500 pounds over already and you're yeah. only three weeks in. I oh, know. That's bad. very bad. As the garden room takes shape Terry turns his attention to the loft conversion but he can't start until he gets the okay from this man. The building inspector. Property developers fear him yet he can be your closest friend. You'll need his certificate when you've finished, confirming the work's up to standard or you won't be able to sell your property. The inspector's here because Terry's assumed his existing walls can take the weight of his massive loft conversion. You should never assume anything. In my experience, the building inspector will always want proof, so Terry now has to dig down into his foundations to see if they are strong enough to take the strain. How big do you want me to have this old... Whatever, just so I can see what's down there. Yeah. But we need to see what is there, because obviously we can't just assume things, otherwise, at the end of the day, if your kind of floor starts collapsing down and your walls move, you won't be very happy. I will do that this afternoon. Fine. I'm going to do that this afternoon, because otherwise I won't be able to sleep tonight. OK, then. OK. Cheers, then. Thanks bye a lot. Cheers, then. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Not a happy chappy. That went well then, didn't it? If they had waited a little bit longer to get things finally kind of sorted on paper, what they intend to do, then it would have been easier. No way. As Terry prepares to dig down into the foundations, it's no wonder he's unhappy. If they aren't strong enough, it'll cost him thousands to underpin them, which means strengthening them from below. And with no loft conversion, it'll probably mean an end to his project. My main battles, I should imagine, is, is the building inspector and the weather. And then it snowed. It's March and everyone's happy in the Rich household. Terry Rich is three months into his eight-month project and he's almost completed the first stage of his big bungalow conversion a huge garden room that's sitting on the back of his £159,000 property. Terry's hoping that this room, along with a two-bedroom loft conversion, will enable him to sell the place for £121,000 profit. It's time to move on now he's ironed out his problems with the building inspector. Well, the building inspector's been back and um, everything is OK. 
The council structural engineer come up with exactly the same as our structural engineer, basically. It was worrying at the time, you know, knowing that it could all go pear-shaped. I think he's just trying to scare me, basically. So Terry's OK with a building inspector, but he's lost a week waiting for approval. This is the point where some developers get really stuck. Your house significantly drops in value when it's in a shambles like this. And if you run out of cash because of bad budgeting, you are in real trouble. Terry bought his house for £159,000, and it's currently worth around £100. Time to catch up with the man himself. Is everything going according to plan? You're on schedule? And Ish. And are you on budget? Ish. <laughs> so obviously no. you've done it, you're, you're, you're ahead of schedule and you're under on no, budget. No, I wouldn't say we're ahead, no, no, <laughs> we're not, no, I don't really know. It's, it, no, I think things are going okay at the yeah. moment. So, uh, according to plan, yeah. Ish. In fact, Terry's very close to going over his budget of 20,000 at this point. He spent 12,000 on materials such as bricks and windows, 2,000 on diggers and skips, 4,000 on tradesmen, as well as 1,000 on plumbing. He's not in trouble yet, as he has some savings, but it's not looking good. Also, he hasn't given the garden designer the go-ahead. Dangerous as a garden takes weeks to mature. We've had so much rain. Well, yeah. We're just waiting for it to dry out a bit. And then you'll start with the garden. Then we start with the garden. Great. Yeah. I want yeah. to see up here. Right. I'll follow you then. <laughs> So you've got a bedroom at this end, yeah. a bedroom at that end, a shower room, and then yes. a little here. Then we decided at the last moment, it doesn't show on the plans, we decided when we got here, there was all this space. So what we're going to do is have an ensuite study. Is there any reason why that couldn't be a shower room? Because an ensuite bathroom for the master bedroom would no, be... No, I don't agree with ensuite. No, each people are different. Yeah, I think... And Sarah I'm... said that she wanted this as a... Yeah. But don't forget, this is not about what you and Sarah want. This is about what sells best on the market and how you get the most money for it. And a master bedroom with an ensuite bathroom is a great selling point. No, that's 80s. Uh, I think you'll spend more time with a computer than in a shower. Change the subject. He's wrong, of course. Ensuite bathrooms constantly appear in the top ten chart of what buyers look for alongside decoration and off-street parking. April's here and Terry's in full swing, trying to meet his August deadline. The plasterers are laying the floor in the garden room. The doors are being put on. And the new decorative windows going in. It must have cost a lot of money, which would have been better spent elsewhere. You don't like it, do you? I didn't say I didn't like it. It is quite unusual, though, isn't it? Quite a statement. Yeah. How much did this cost? We don't know yet. No idea. We'll wait till they put it in, <laughs> then we'll ask. No. It's considerably more expensive than a paint yeah. sheet of glass, yeah, isn't it? It yeah. is. If you don't keep a very good rein on your finances, it, could, it can run away with you very, very easily. This is it. I can't believe that Terry doesn't know some of his costs at this point in his renovation. He's heading for big trouble. Oh, I love it. After the window, it's time to concentrate on the staircase to his first floor. If you're after a standard staircase made from wood with no special specifications, you can go to a timber merchant's. You can buy the staircase and all the components you need there, such as banisters and handrails. If you want a unique style or one specially designed to fit into an awkward space, then you need a good joiner or a specialist company. Terry thought he'd have to pay up to £2,000, but he found a bargain for 500 designed by a specialist company in Wales. Hold on, stuck. Gosh, no. I'm crooked as anything. <laughs> I level. Brilliant. It's May, and Terry starts thinking about the finishing touches. He can now see the light at the end of the tunnel, but there's one snag. He's been using his mates to do the work, and the electricians have let him down. I never use friends for precisely this reason. You need an electrician round to do some work before the plaster could do anything, and the electrician doesn't turn up. So there goes a day, 
just like that. So it, that's what's slowing it up. Problems always come in threes. And here's the second one. Some dodgy pipes start flooding Terry's bathroom. Is it OK? Yeah. Um, it's coming out. Oh, sod it now. You're kidding. <laughs> oh, I don't believe it. That's f***ing useless. That's it. The bloody plumber can come out and poxy do it. And the plumber's involved with a third problem, which has resulted in Terry having to dig up the floor of his garden room. Saturday morning, woke up, sitting here eating my cornflakes, and we saw puzzle on the floor. So we, we dug this out. It was the wrong joint that was on there. It was the plumber who put the wrong joint on it. They don't really give excuses, do they? It's just one of them things. No harm done, I think was the sentence. No harm done. Beware of dodgy workmanship. Unless you sign a contract with your tradesmen, there are few methods of comeback if you're unhappy with their work. Your tradesmen may be registered with the Federation. If so, you could try complaining to them about the standard of the work. But another option, which I think safer, is to retain 20% of the full fee until you're entirely satisfied with the job. However, this must be negotiated with your tradesmen in advance. This delays all Terry needs. He's going to pass his deadline. Pressure's really beginning to show on the family. We had no heat in probably one of the coldest days, actually. So, like, Bo's been going to bed in a scarf and tracksuit bottoms and goodness knows what else. I've been going to bed in gym jam socks. It's, it was freezing, absolutely freezing. So, is it very hard with children yeah, to be it is, it properly is. developing? And is it fair on them? It's not for long. They're very, they're very good, actually. We are very lucky with our children. They're very, they are good. In my experience, doing this sort of thing when you're young and you've got no children, you can survive. That's but much easier with no children. The concept of developing a property with three children sounds an absolute nightmare. A couple of times, I've, if I could walk away from this, I would do. I have actually said that to Terry. If I could walk away, I would. Especially when it was really cold, when it was muddy and wet and... Oh, God. Poor Sarah. Even though Terry's building the place, she has the hardest job steering the children through all the work. Hopefully that'll end when they meet their deadline, sell this house and buy two more. Something that may cheer her up is the new kitchen. They've left it to the last minute and I can see it's going to be expensive. So this design yeah. that you've drawn here yeah. in the kitchen they've chosen and this worktop, how much is it? You're looking at about eight and a half thousand pounds, fully installed. That's an awful lot of money on a kitchen. It's probably twice as much as what we'd want to spend, but yeah. we've got to get the kitchen right. And the price we're going to ask for this house, this is the most important room of the house. Maybe you should think about fitting it yourself and in, instead no. of actually no. No. getting them to fit it. because no, it won't get done this year. No. It won't get finished this year. They'll be in and out, it'll be done. What we try and do is spend a bit more money on the kitchen and try and get it from another room. So we're trying to save on another room somehow. So that, again, I'm doing all the decorating and things like that. So I'm saving, by me doing the decorating, I'm saving money. So you've, you've got to get the kitchen right. Definitely. But it's still a lot of money and you could save well, some money there. Go. there. <laughs> well, you're going to drop it down? Hold your fingers. And he'll definitely have to claw this back somehow. So Terry's going to start doing more of the work himself to cut costs. I feel I need to lend a gentle helping hand to push him along faster. It's time to knock the wall down that divides the old kitchen and the new garden room. That's great! It's going to be it's very cool, isn't it? Well, it's With the kitchen fun. connected to the garden room, I can see Terry's plan coming together. Now it's time to crack on with a bit of plastering. But be careful if you decide to do your own DIY, because it can reduce the value of your property if it's not up to scratch. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh. <laughs> As June rolls on, Terry faces one of those unforeseen problems that could hit any of you when property developing. It involves his skip. Innocent looking enough, they come in various sizes. It'll cost you between 75 and 150 pounds. You'll also need a permit from the council if it's going to go on the road, but your skip company should supply this. Oh, and you must have lights on it if it's on the road at night, and this is Terry's problem. A neighbour's complained that his has no lights after almost driving into it, and the council threatened Terry with a £100 fine. Another tip, be considerate to your neighbours when you're developing. 
they're unlikely to appreciate your skips. We'll have to get that off the road, I think. No, I'm not going to get it off the road. I'm going to wind the bloody neighbours up even more. Some neighbours are okay, but you get some that are just jealous, just don't like you improving your house. It's been there for about three months now, so they're obviously getting fed up with it round here. I'm looking for a curtain to twitch. <laughs> Whatever curtain twitches, we know we complained. And the skip's now going to be stretched to breaking point as the old kitchen's dumped and his brand new eight and a half thousand pound models put in. It would be nice to be able to cook something again. And here comes the cavalry to sort out the electrics that have been left dangling by one of Terry's mates. It's not just costing Terry extra money to clear up the mess, time's also ticking away as his August deadline approaches. It's August, and Terry Rich has spent the last six months extending his bungalow upwards and outwards to sell on for a huge profit. He's built a big garden room at the back, and he's added two new bedrooms in the loft, as well as a shower room, study and toilet. So here it is, almost finished. Just a tiny bit of plastering and decorating left to do. But the cost to Terry so far, £50,000. That's over twice his original budget. However, that 50000 has doubled the size of the bungalow. The unused loft space has become two new bedrooms and an ensuite study, which I still think should have been an ensuite bathroom. But he does have a separate shower room on the landing and a sparkling new toilet. Downstairs, he spruced up the place by stripping the garish wallpaper that came supplied and painting it some interesting colours. It's his daughter's room, so Terry's not concerned about the shade of pink. In the living room, they've put in a rather unique contemporary fireplace of brushed aluminium. To make the room feel even bigger, they've hung a large mirror and kept the furniture to a bare minimum. And we see Terry and Sarah's taste in the odd ornament here and there, and of course their love of coloured glass. Their huge decorative window now dominates the hallway of the bungalow. Instead of a front door, they now have a blaze of colour that floods this space. But the centrepiece of his project is at the back of the house, and the top of the range kitchen has all mod cons. Terry spared no expense with the appliances in the hope of impressing potential buyers. The sloping windows of the new garden room allow the sun in all day because the room's south-facing. He's built it from scratch and it really shows off the views of their endless garden. And talking of the garden, instead of having it landscaped as originally planned, they've simply turfed it instead. This is because they needed to pull back some money to spend elsewhere. Oh, it's a lovely light room. I it love is. this room. Really love it. I'm really pleased with this That's an amazing yeah. fireplace. How much was the fireplace? With VAT, it's about £1,800. It's a lot of money there on a fireplace, isn't it? But I think a room needs a focal point, mm, as I'd opposed agree to the you. television. Yes, yeah. I'd agree with you. Yeah. Because it's such a statement, the fireplace, it's again something that people might really like or might yeah, not like. True. Mm -hmm. And you are restricting your market by doing that. So this is your fantastic stained glass window. Uh -huh. How much did it cost? Was it £500? Hey, it's £600. I only just found out the cost. It's £600. It's a lot of money on a window. It's mad, really. Mad. Yeah. Do you not think that perhaps if you put just frosted glass in, you could have saved six hundred pounds, and it'd be six hundred pounds off your budget? Makes it a really light, airy space, and the fact it's got a bit of colour on as well, it all comes down onto the cup. It's lovely. But at the end of the day, it is a statement that you're making, and whoever buys this house, there are a number of things in the house that are are very much your taste and you will be narrowing your market for it and whoever your buyer is is going to be somebody with very similar taste to your own mm. i think whatever house you buy there's always going to be someone's personal taste there that you're not going to agree with not only is it a waste of money but it's blocked up the front door and now the only entrance into the house is through the kitchen utterly impractical if your boss comes back from meeting these stairs are lovely 
Three coats of varnish took me about six hours to do. Upstairs are the two bedrooms. And off the back one is the worst mistake Terry's made. It's a nice big room, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So you did, in the end, decide to make it a study and not an ensuite bathroom. Yeah. yeah. Would you now say that it would be better as an ensuite? Or are you happy with this as a study? Because yeah. it is one of the top five selling factors of a house is an ensuite bathroom. I think a computer room's important because so many people work from home these days. I'm not sure if you were going to work from home that you'd want your office through the bedroom, though. You don't like it, then? I would rather have an ensuite bathroom than an ensuite study, I have to say. To be quite honest, it's very easy to put a bathroom in there because most of the pipe works behind this wall. I know what, what you're saying, but... Um, we don't agree again. We don't agree again. <laughs> As we head back downstairs, it's time to pay Terry a compliment on his achievement. This is a fantastic room, it really is. This is the nicest room in the house. Mm. And with an amazing view, which will definitely help mm. sell the house. Yes. Views always are a very big selling point for a house. Terry and Sarah have styled the place to their own tastes, which are quite specific. They've got a Japanese theme going, which is risky. You should keep designs as neutral as possible so that people don't get any preconceived ideas which might put them off. When you came to style the house, did you use a lot of your own stuff or have you bought a lot of it? It's a mixture of both. We, we did have a, lots of bits and pieces, that obviously like table chairs which are our own, but in this room in particular, because we wanted to bring the, the garden sort of inside, um, we bought a, a water feature and other odd, odd bits and pieces that hopefully sort of make it sort of one space, if you like. Right. Pleasantry's over. Let's talk hard cash and find out what went wrong. So you bought the bungalow for £159,000 and your original budget was £20,000. Was it really? Did I really say £20,000? You sure? Oh, yes. You were hoping to sell it for £300,000. Now, that would have made you a profit of £121,000. How much have you actually spent? I think it's about uh, 50. 50 So you went hugely over budget. £50,000 instead of £20,000 is a massive difference. Why do you think you went so far over it? We, I have an idea. The last house we took about three years to do it and it was a lot cheaper because I did a lot of it myself. This year we decided to try and get it done as quick as possible. All the time properties going up, we thought, well, let's, let's do it quickly and get it back on the market. So by doing it quicker, we had more people in. I think that's where the, that's where the money went. So it's £30,000 of labour? Yeah. Mm. Ish. It's a lot of labour, isn't it? And it wasn't just the labour that put him over budget. There's the decorative window, not reading his plans properly, trusting friends to do the work, the list goes on. But Terry's very lucky, because his massive overspend's been financed by the profits from his previous houses. Now it's time to find out just how much this one's worth. Terry's asked the agents to value the place, and here are their verdicts. If it's ready for the market, I would say to do this a bit more neutral. And in the corner of this back bedroom, what do they make of the ensuite study? I would have said this would make a, a good ensuite shower room, and I think that's really more important than a study. It's what people want. I think marginally an ensuite bathroom might have added more value than a study. A nicely fitted kitchen, nice units, good lighting. Now, I love this room. This is absolutely fantastic. It's a wonderful family room, and um, the vaulted ceiling creates that feeling of space. I think that the bungalow is not going to appeal to people that have got very, very conservative tastes. Um, this is going to appeal to somebody who likes some striking features. It's a very nice garden, lovely garden, lovely outlook, and this stream makes a nice uh, feature as well. So Terry's aiming for a 300,000 asking price. But can he get even more? I would think we'd be looking of putting the property on the market at a figure around £285,000. This would come on around the £300,000 mark. So we could quote a figure in the region of £300,000, possibly a little higher, say £310,000. You've had three valuations coming in at £285,000, £300,000 and £310,000. What are you going to put us on the market at? £315,000. So over the highest valuation. Yeah. 
The danger with pricing it over the highest valuation is that you won't actually get anybody in the door. It would be safer and you'd have more people interested if you put it on at less. If you can get it just under 300 to 295, if it's worth 315, people will pay 315. Mm. But you're more likely to get people actually coming through the door to look at it. Why, why, do you, why have you put it on at more than the highest figure? I would hate to put it on the market for 285 and sold it tomorrow. I'd be gutted. Uh, I know what the estate agents are doing. They want to sell it tomorrow. They don't want it on their books, do they? Too long. We need them to sell it and we're going to use it as a guide, but they are wrong. Don't forget, the agents will value your property, but the real value is only as much as someone's willing to pay. And the only way to find that out is to ask the viewers themselves. Will the families meet Terry's price tag of 315000 Pink. It's, uh... it's, it's lovely. It's very nice. It's like a, it's like a little princess room, isn't it? Very nice, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Plenty of space. Bright, light, plenty of room. Just really what you need. Plenty yeah. of storage space. Yes, perfect. Places, yeah. Harry, do you like the window? Yeah! You like the window, do you? Yeah, I like it. Personally, I would have had a ensuite bathroom there or even a dressing room. It's one of the things we are moving for, for extra bathroom and cupboard area. And there's no fitted cupboards in here at all. Wow. Yeah. Beautiful room. I mean, it serves as, a, as like a conservatory, but it's better than a conservatory. For us as a family, I think that garden is ideal because we've got boys who play football and we need a flat expanse of grass. There's some very nice features in the bungalow, but it wasn't enough to uh, make us feel, yes, we'll have this house because of the lacking of the actual space, wardrobe space and the uh, ensuite bathroom. Yeah. I think probably 280000 might be a more realistic yes, price. There's nothing in this price bracket where you've got views, you haven't got any work to do. Um, so personally, yeah, I think it's worth every penny of it. Hopefully, if things go well, we could, you know, and it all goes through, we can sell our house, we can make an offer. So one against, one for. Looks like the future might be bright for Terry and his 315,000. So if you get 315,000 pounds, you'll make 106,000 pounds profit. What are you planning on doing next? We're probably going to um, rent it. And then what I should do is probably find a property that needs work doing it. Have it empty so that when the electricians come in, you can imagine electricians, plumbers, they've got it empty. So you'll be renting one to live in and buy another to do up. That was the whole idea yeah. at the beginning, really, wasn't it? So we can get to the stage where, yes, hopefully we could get two properties. <coughs> So we could live in one? Yes. <laughs> Me and the children could live in another? Plus, but plus, it would get done quicker. You know, for the children, that would be a great option. Our daddy's out of the way, <laughs> and we can just sort of get on with our lives, and they can have their friends round, and we can get on with things without mess all over the place. Yeah. So Terry's 315,000 price tag will give him 106,000 profit. Not bad. But... If he'd stuck to his budget, his profit would have been a fantastic £136,000. Of course, any profits may be subject to tax and there'll be professional fees to pay. Terry has taken three serious gambles with this project. One, that £20,000 would cover the job. Two, that he could go ahead without breaking down his costs. And three, that he'd hit his target price of £300,000. Only one of these gambles has paid off, and that's the only one he had absolutely no control over. It's only on at £315,000 because the market has risen. The other two, however, have cost him a whacking £30,000. Please take your budget seriously. Terry and Sarah have uh, received a number of offers of over £300,000, which means they should make a profit of about 85000 There's more on the property ladder at channel4.com forward slash for homes. Next on 4, why did the Duchess of York's former dresser brutally murder the man she was due to marry? Dress to kill the downfall of Jane Andrews is next. <laughs>